Hello, everybody, and welcome to another OpenShift Commons briefing. Um, today, we have a new OpenShift Commons member, new ODB, who's going to um, give us an overview on um, what they're doing with their offering and um, talk a lot about Elastic SQL and OpenShift and how to do all that. So we've got a couple of folks. I'll let Christina Wong um, introduce her team, and we'll just get started. So thanks, Christina. Take it away. Thanks, Diane. Uh, welcome, everybody. Thanks for you know, attending, listening in on this briefing. We're really excited to be part of the OpenShift Commons community. Uh, my name is Christina Wong. I'm the Director of Partnerships and Product Marketing here at NuoDB. Um, I'm joined by Joe Leslie, our Senior Product Manager here at NuoDB. Um, he's going to be giving the bulk of the presentation. However, the other person we have in the room is Ben Higgins, and he's our DevOps engineer. He's the one who's been doing a lot of the Red Hat OpenShift uh, container platform integration. And so if anyone has any questions for the team, um, on the last slide in this briefing, we do have contact information. Feel free to reach out anytime. So, uh, Joe, I'll let you take it from here. Great. Thank you, Christina. And uh, happy Friday to everyone. Um, and, um, yeah, we look forward to uh, presenting new ODB uh, running in OpenShift today. So uh, a good chunk of our presentation is going to be a, a, a live demo. Um, but we are going to run through some initial slides just to introduce you to new ODB and who we are, what we're all about, and the problems we're, we're trying to solve. Um, feel free to, um, to ask questions as we go, and we can um, go about this uh, you know, interactively and, and have a nice conversation. So yes, it's just started. It's basically what we want to do, uh, introduce no DB and this concept of the Elastic SQL database. Um, we'll talk through um, in a little more detail about the OpenShift and, and container integration uh, that we've built, and, and then we'll go uh, right into demo. Finish with some QA. All right, so um, let's first uh, set the stage a little bit. As, um, as many companies today are seeking to, um, to move to the cloud or already in the cloud, there are certain challenges, and uh, new ODB, um, we've, we've looked at uh, these challenges in, in a couple of uh, areas where there's critical requirements that, that need to be met. Um, you know, everyone, as they move applications to the cloud, we're looking for this elasticity. Uh, we want to ensure that we can run our applications uh, on commodity hardware in the cloud, but it's really important that the applications have this uh, scale out and scale in, right? We want to be able to uh, extend our applications, uh, you know, deliver more transactional throughput when needed, but at the same time also uh, scale back uh, if needed. And all the while, we want to make sure that our applications uh, today are continuously available. Um, even the concept of high availability is something that's not quite high enough these days. And uh, many of our, our customers come to us seeking zero downtime and continuous availability. So in order to achieve all these, uh, in, the, in the world of SQL databases, um, it, it, there's often you, you have to give things up. And, and uh, the, the problem that we've solved at New ODB is we've been able to deliver a, a true SQL database that is uh, ANSI compliant and, and ACID uh, transaction property uh, consistent um, in an environment like this. Um, so you can leverage your existing uh, SQL applications. Um, you can leverage your investment in the people that you have and the skills that they have and, and continue to run uh, basically in a SQL database environment, which traditionally ran, runs well in a, a scale up environment, right? We, we just, we can add more memory, more CPU and more storage, but very difficult to provide a database that can run uh, in a domain of hardware where that hardware um, exists in, uh, you know, across geographical regions um, and, and all the while presenting a single SQL database. So, so that's what uh, new ODB um, ha has accomplished uh, and provides as a product. So if we, uh, if we continue and we look into um, a little more detail, uh, this next slide shows some of the common solutions and, and what uh, the approaches have been um, either a shared disk solution, um, which you know these can be uh, you know very very complex and and expensive when we consider clustering software and 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 uh, 
sharing the disks. And here's a couple of examples here, the Oracle Rack and DB2 Pure Scale. Um, but there's also this shared nothing or, or sharding approach, and these also have their challenges, um, requiring um, applications to have more knowledge about where to get the data. Um, so while there's uh, these solutions out there, um, none are truly meeting the, um, uh, the desired requirements. So introduce the Elastic SQL database. So new ODB, and effectively what we've done, and it's here in this architectural diagram, uh, we see a legacy architecture, which is, you know, much like I described earlier, sort of a, a stack of processes running in a single architecture where you have your query processing and your storage. Um, in, in a single um, server. What the new ODB architecture has done is it, it takes this and it breaks it into the two critical components, the, uh, the transactional component and the storage manager component. So these transactional components are pictured in green. And we call these transaction engines, or TEs, and uh, they're responsible for uh, servicing the application connection request, and SQL request, and uh, it is a uh, an in-memory version of the database. So it it, it uh, runs a durable cache. So uh, NuoDB is delivering high-performance SQL transactions. And um, when the application runs, uh, for example, a DML statement like an insert, update, or a delete, needs to make changes, you know, to the database, uh, the transaction is then handed off to the storage manager component, which is pictured here in this sort of uh, yellow color. And, uh, and uh, this is also a scalable component. Uh, it's, it's critical to understand that all the components are um, um, uh, scalable in that you can create redundancy. So should you lose a transaction engine or lose a storage manager, uh, it's okay because you have a, another one running. And that's that's part of the um, uh, the architecture that in, in, that delivers the the zero downtime uh, capability. Um, so these storage managers as well. Um, these, um, as I mentioned, this is the durable part. So this is the D and ACID, the durable portion of the transaction. So once that transaction is committed to disk, should there be a, a failure, you can always reliably go back and and retrieve that data. Um, so, so you know, this is a very, uh, you know, very, very flexible uh, architecture, and uh, it deploys nicely across data centers and works very well in a cloud environment, a microservices type environment, where you, uh, your, your, um, the database is comprised of processes that you can then um, spread across a domain um, of hardware um, uh, geographically. Okay. So here's just a, a, another slide that diagrams an employment, uh, employment example of an active-active, true master-master model where we have a multi-data center um, deployment. And we can see we have uh, two availability zones, and uh, our applications are being serviced in both zones. And we have you know, some number of transaction engines that we're um, uh, providing in each availability zone for, for local, quick uh, connectivity to the database. And then you'll notice they have, each has a copy of the database. Um, the storage manager represents an on-disk copy of the database. And uh, new ODB also um, allows for larger implementations to effectively spill these storage managers over to other ones so you can have a single large data set spanning across a storage manager. We call that concept storage groups. And it's um, a question we get when, when customers ask, you know, when we scale out the storage, um, you know, can the storage manager grow beyond a single copy of the database? It absolutely can. And, and uh, the way we do that is through our storage uh, group abstraction layer. Um, so again, what we're providing here is a single logical database. It spans across a geographical area. And uh, within this domain of hardware resources, um, the, the resources themselves can either be on-premise or in the cloud. It just doesn't matter. Um, NoDB provides that flexibility. 
Okay, so just um, you know, recapping some of what we talked about on the high-level um, areas of NoODB and why it's um, a good solution for running uh, databases either on-prem or in the cloud. This elasticity that we've been talking about, the ease of of um, extending out uh, the the uh, transactional throughput for your applications by um, scaling out read and write capability. Um, um, and we talked about the scale in to minimize so you're, you're not over provisioning. Um, and again, this is where we get this elastic concept. And um, the, the, the deployment flexibility we talked about as far as deploying either on-prem or in the cloud in a hybrid environment. Uh, New ODB is, is quite uh, happy to, to uh, work in all of those environments and across those environments at the same time. All the while, not giving up the SQL semantics that so many of our applications require, right? We've got uh, SQL applications and our investment in SQL and our, our resources and people who, who know the SQL, and we want to continue to run in a, a kind of a SQL transactional environment. Um, and uh, New ODB um, uh, does a great job also um, meeting those requirements. Okay. So now we're just going to look at uh, some of the details um, about our OpenShift uh, integration environment. So here's a, um, a diagram that, that shows us um, an OpenShift environment, sort of a stack diagram showing us our routing la layers and our persistent storage layers and uh, the different service uh, layers that, that lead to our, our physical and virtual and private and public environments. Um, and we see that um, you know, we have the, the master section with um, uh, with the application authentication, the data store uh, services, the scheduling services, all of the pieces that are there, part of the Red Hat Enterprise uh, Linux platform. But then we also see the nodes and how we have um, um, created a, a resilient environment where um, we we run the uh, the application and the, the new ODB uh, transactional and storage manager components in different uh, nodes or pods, uh, so we have uh, the resiliency and and that um, redundant environment such that should there be a failure, um, uh, the system will continue to process uh, connections and SQL requests. Um, all the while, the OpenShift environment will enforce um, those pods, and uh, should should one uh, fail, uh, it will automatically restart uh, the pod. And we're going to see that in today's, uh, today's uh, demonstration. So just talking through some of the, you know, what's available as far as the different deployment models, the single versus multiple, you, you can have your services that, that are serviced by a single large database, um, or they can also be serviced by, um, uh, uh, you know, smaller databases per service, uh, where new ODB services those um, applications. And then through a query feder federation uh, model, you can then um, retrieve uh, the data across those different applications. So likewise, if you uh, would like to then um, uh, roll that data up uh, into a more aggregated view, it's quite simple then to um, uh, to do that and, and effectively create a single larger logical database view for reporting uh, and analytics. Uh, so NoDB provides that flexibility so you can have dedicated TEs and SMs to the individual uh, microservices. Okay. Now we're just going to talk about a little more of the details of you know, what we've built and, and how new ODB works uh, within an OpenShift environment. We've used the, the Jenkins build process, the uh, package tools that we've built. Um, it's the, uh, you know, the OpenShift uh, OC command um, along, you know, providing the, uh, the easy environment to, to work and administer the product, um, as well as the AWS CLI command um, and, and uh, new ODB does the, um, the, the monitoring and collecting of data uh, so that information is then available for um, the operational aspects of, of monitoring and managing a new ODB system running in OpenShift. So here's a little more details of the different pieces that are involved. Um, again, I mentioned the OpenShift uh, OC command. 
Um, this is, uh, you know, how we uh, can self-deploy and, and uh, manually deploy uh, the environment. Um, it's, uh, you know, basically you have your choice of running uh, how you how you like, and sort of, as I mentioned earlier, you know, kind of local or an AWS on-prem and in the cloud, um, you know, all via the, um, you know, the, the Docker run uh, environment. Okay, we're going to get to see all this in action today in our, our presentation. We, we do want to talk a little bit, though, about some of the storage um, and, and how this is working. Um, so we've, we've got uh, uh, imperial storage, uh, two storage managers, as which I had mentioned earlier. We see that in the diagram where we have multiple storage managers for storage redundancy should a storage manager fail. Um, we know our database um, still has a consistent copy available. Um, for our applications. Um, the persistent storage piece uses the AWS, uh, um, you know, e EBS, the, the Elastic Block uh, Storage. Um, and uh, for the Red Hat storage solution, um, um, the, the, the CNS storage is, is uh, what we're using. And, um, you know, um, we're, uh, we're still in the process of looking at um, other storage solutions. We want to make sure that we provide um, all the storage solutions that uh, our customers are seeking to use. Um, but those are the basic ones that um, we're offering today. Um, the, um, the, the last point is an important one, uh, just uh, so we understand that if we should lose a container, that the new container that comes and replaces it will automatically reattach to the archives. Uh, therefore, um, there's no need to uh, resync with the data uh, with an existing full copy, uh, once the new storage manager comes into play, uh, it's um, it's already an, a full working uh, copy of the database. And uh, so, as far, you know, as far as the auto scaling and monitoring and log stash options, um, here's uh, you know just a few few more details of of what's available um, from an application scaling standpoint. Um, and uh, this, this is some of the concepts around auto scaling, the, the uh, scaling nanny. This is something we're currently working on. It's a, a work in progress, but we've had a lot of requests in this area, and this is a really exciting piece um, that we're looking forward to deliver that um, the, the system will auto detect uh, effectively when to uh, balance the transactional and storage manager components of the system. So basically auto scale, scaling out, scaling in uh, as needed based on the application um, load and ensuring a certain uh, transactional, you know, transactions per second and ensuring that the latency uh, uh, re remains uh, low. So, um, you know, the log stash environment, the elastic stash, um, you know, log stash and Kibana, this is a... Uh, all delivered together in the ELK framework that's available to provide the, the monitoring um, uh, uh, detail. Um, ben, is there anything uh, else to add on this that you may want to add, or is that? Uh, we can you know, hold for questions during the demo. That sounds great. That's awesome. All right. In fact, I think we're uh, we're about ready to uh, go ahead and have some fun and and uh, you know go ahead and see what new ODB looks like uh, running in in OpenShift environment. Awesome. We love live demos. <laughs> All right. Well, we're going to, um, here. So, um, actually, so let's, um, we're, we're going to go ahead and start our demo. We're going to, uh, I'm going to put away the slide presentation and we're going to move over to the, um, um, the OpenShift environment. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and log into my environment. Okay, and what we see in OpenShift is we have a, uh, a new ODB deployment. Um, and let's talk about some of the pods that are running. Uh, this first pod is called the admin uh, service. Uh, this is a very important piece of the, uh, the new ODB uh, management tier. It, it's the part that manages the domain. Several times in our presentation today, we've talked about a domain of of resources. Um, 
The, uh, the admin is responsible for managing the NuoDB transaction engines and storage managers on the host that it's, it's running. So within its process space, uh, it's managing the, the NuoDB uh, engine processes. Um, it, it's also the one that's responsible for load balancing. Uh, as the connection requests come in, it will determine a, a TE that meets the serv serviceable requirements of the, the client. For example, if the client is in a particular region, uh, it will deliver a transaction engine in that region so uh, we can reduce any latencies while connecting to the database. The, uh, the, another pod we have here running today is our Nuo app. This is actually just um, an application pod. We're going to run most of our demo today from this application pod. So when we run the SQLs and various things, we'll, we'll be running from, from this uh, uh, environment. And then down below here, we see the actual real workings of the NuoDB system, the, the two components we talked about earlier, the, the transaction engine, which is uh, labeled here as a TE, and the storage manager, that piece that's responsible for the, uh, the durable uh, on-disk copy of the database. And that's pictured here. So, so far we can see we've got a very basic setup, right? We've just got one pod of each. Um, uh, before we scale out this environment, we're just going to take a look at what it, uh, the system looks like from the, um, uh, from the new ODB side. So, we're going to come over to some command line prompts. And uh, let's take a look. I'm going to run a new ODB command. It's actually the one that's uh, presented on your screen here already. But let's run it again. We see we have a live system. And it's showing us uh, these components. So um, focusing right here, we have this server. Now, this is the one that I call the admin service. And we see that um, it's, um, it's, last, it's liveliness. It just checked in uh, just two seconds ago. And its state is active. It's the leader. Uh, you can have multiple admin services. If you were to have multiple geographies uh, in, within your domain, you would have multiple admin services. And um, you know, we see this one is connected uh, here. So it's active, connected, and running. Our demo today, we just have the, the single uh, admin service. But down below, we also have a, uh, a demo database. It's our hockey database. Uh, so for those of you who might follow hockey a little bit, uh, we'll get to see some hockey data. Because uh, we're going to want to show a, an active running system. So we're going to use this little demo system. And we see that it's up and running. It has um, a storage manager here uh, component. It's running on IP address, we're just going to say one, uh, 103. And uh, it also has a liveliness number. We see it's checked in uh, just four seconds ago. And we have a transaction engine as well uh, pictured here. And uh, it's, it's on IP address 104. So let's go ahead and make a connection to our database. Okay. And um, you know, at this point, we'll notice that it's connecting to IP address 104, right? Obviously, that's going to be the case. We only have one transaction engine, so that's all it has to connect to. And I'm just going to move this one over a little bit so we can see over there it's connecting. And it continues to process uh, application connection requests, and it says that, yep, I'm, I'm delivering them all on, on 104. Okay? Um, so. So now that we've seen uh, you know, a little bit of, of how it's connecting, we're, we're now going to uh, create that hockey database that I mentioned. So I'm going to go ahead and create that database. So we're just running some SQL here to create that hockey database, loading up some player and scoring data and some team data. And uh, for those of you that are familiar with hockey, you might recognize some of these names that were we're going to display. We're going to write some standard SQL, SQL that you may be familiar with, you know, uh, traditional, you know, inner and outer join types of statements with filters, and, and uh, let's go ahead and do that. So our hockey application is called hockey.sql. We're going to run that uh, little statement. It runs a, a couple of uh, SQL statements that we can see here on the screen, right, running some standard SQL. So for those of you that might wonder, well, what, what does the SQL look like in new ODB? Well, it looks exactly like the SQL you're used to. It's all ANSI standard SQL compliant. 
Um, you know, in this case, uh, we, we were joining a, a from clause with a, a list of tables, all of the uh, today's common, uh, you know, inner and outer join and left join syntax is all supported, as well as any SQL functions that you run in common database products like MySQL and Oracle and SQL Server. We've taken quite a survey of the uh, arithmetic and uh, date and, and string functions and we support most all of them. Uh, so what that means is when you, when you run a MySQL statement in NuoDB, it's gonna be quite happy to run in NuoDB without changing your SQL. Likewise, if you run an Oracle statement, maybe you were using Oracle concat with the double bar, and uh, NuoDB would be quite happy to run that. The reason that's important is, you know, whenever those SQLs tend to cross over to other databases, uh, they won't work, right? If you run an Oracle double, concat against MySQL, it's not going to work. You run a MySQL concat function against Oracle, it doesn't work. Um, so for new ODB, we've tried to really survey what's out and available in the SQL function space and support it. And I just wanted to share that because it makes uh, moving your applications to new ODB that much easier. So we see some hockey data, right? Um, this, this last one here shows uh, some cumulative all-time scoring goals for uh, some popular players. This is the top 10 uh, goal leaders out there. Gordie Howe, he's an old timer. He played quite a long time ago. Wayne Gretzky, another uh, you know familiar name probably for many of you. And we can see their, um, their goal count, right? So Gordie Howe scored 975 and uh, Wayne Gretzky, uh, not quite as many, 940. Uh, but we do see that Wayne Gretzky uh, has appeared three times uh, as a, a season leader in goal scoring. Um, so that's just some of the data. We're gonna, we're gonna look at that in a little more detail as we get a little further in, into our presentation. But let's go ahead and scale our environment. We're, we're now ready to, to go ahead and, and go back to our OpenShift environment. And let's add more transactional throughput to our environment. So I'm gonna open up the transaction engine pod and using the familiar uh, uh, you know, up and down widget uh, spin control here, I'm, I'm going to add three more transaction engines. <clears throat> All right, so the system is now adding those. We now have four transaction engines. So if we go back to our environment, uh, we can go ahead and and run that same command we did before that shows the domain. But now we can see, instead of just one SM and one TE, we can see we have a, a whole bunch of transaction engines that are all up and running and ready to service our application. So if we go back to that other SQL statement where we're just gonna generate a lot of load against the system, each connection is reporting which transaction it connects to. If you recall, previously we only connected to uh, TE-104, right, this one, because <clears throat> that's all that was available. If you look to the left now, you can see all the other transaction engines are actively um, responding to the system. I see 69, 105, <clears throat> um, 104. Um, so we see that they're all uh, 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 processing uh, actively the transaction and SQL request um, that, that our application is running. Um, now, what we can also do is we can have some fun here and um, remove some transaction engines. And let's watch what uh, OpenShift and, and how it responds to that sort of system uh, or that sort of um, event. Um, we'll see that you know, OpenShift is going to enforce the database and quickly replace any failed processes. Um, Let's go ahead and do that. We're, uh, <clears throat> we're going to go over here and, and I'm going to uh, copy the, um, uh, the transaction engine uh, pod name. I am going to need to reconnect into another window. Let's do that. And then we'll, we'll run an OC, um, <clears throat> excuse me, delete pod. So we're going we're gonna to be unfriendly today. And we're just going to remove these pods right from underneath the system. Okay. Notice, all, here we go. We'll remove them both at the same time. Paste. 
all right, we just removed a couple of pods, okay? But notice all the while to the left, our application continues to run. It's, uh, it has two other transaction engines running, and the other two <clears throat> have already been replaced. In fact, they've been replaced prior to new ODB reporting that the other two have been removed. Let's, uh, if we do this, yeah. So if we do this quick enough, we can see it's actually in the process right now of um, those two being removed and two being added. Okay. This will just take a moment uh, to update, and we can see uh, there's there's three. So so it's uh, currently working its way back to four. There we are. We're now hit stable. Uh, we've replaced two of them, and we have four running. And we can see our new ones. 70 and 71, if we look to the left, they're already servicing application requests. So this is a, a great demonstration to show how OpenShift enforces the new ODB uh, database. Once you set in, um, in uh, OpenShift your policy of the number of transaction engines and storage managers, it will make it so. It will, it will continue to monitor the system and enforce uh, those service levels. Um, okay, so now we've scaled the transaction environment up. Uh, let, let's go ahead and uh, scale it back down. All right, we're going to go ahead and bring it down to, uh, we'll bring it back down to two, right? We'll uh, <laughs> say we no longer need our four and our application is just quite happy to run with, uh, with two transaction engines. Okay, so it's currently scaling back to two. We uh, see how it's doing here. It's currently scaling back down. You see, it just usually takes uh, you know several minutes to to scale back down. But what well, we can see, it's already done. Uh, we've scaled our environment back down. So now what we can do is let's demonstrate the same sort of concept with our storage manager. Okay, and to do that, window is just break out of my application. It just wants to keep. There we go. There's just uh, let me reconnect to our application. Scripts, hockey. Whoops, uh, that's not the right one. I think it was Z. Bash. There we go. Okay. All right. So we lost that window, but now we're back. Okay. So now what we're going to do is um, we're going we're gonna to show how we can scale the storage environment. But the way we're going to do that is we are going to make a change to the data. We're going to show how that change propagates from storage manager to storage manager. Even in the event of a failure, uh, we'll show that the change will persist in the new storage managers that are being created. Um, so so I'll, uh, I'll go ahead and um, you know, let's, let's walk through this. Uh, so let's start back with um, we're going to run that um, uh, that previous command. Here, let me get that, that command back for us, where we're going to run the hockey uh, SQL. And we'll show our hockey players, hockey.sql. Remember this one? It showed us Gordy Howe has 975 goals. Um, well, as, as some of you are aware, Gordy Howe, he was an old timer, right? He played long ago. Um, and uh, even though Gordy Howe is a top of the all-time goal scoring list, largely because if you look at the number of years he played, right, 32 years. Um, but it might be interesting to project out just how many goals, uh, all-time uh, goals, Gordy Howe might have scored if he played the standard 82 games per season. So we're going to run a little projection. And we're going to update Gordy Howe. 
Okay, we're going to update Gordy Howe. We're also going to update Bobby Hall. Okay, Bobby Hall was another old timer. He, uh, for much of his career, he also did not play 82 games. Um, so it'd be kind of interesting to compare Gordy Howe and Bobby Hall against Wayne Gretzky uh, if we sort of equalize if they all played um, 82 games. So here's a SQL, couple SQL statements that update our database. And, um, and now we'll notice if we uh, run our hockey application, we see that Gordy Howe would have been projected to score uh, over 1,000 goals, 1,143 goals, right? Uh, if you notice, Bobby Hull moved into second. He actually moved past Wayne Gretzky, okay? But for this um, part of the um, demo, what I really want everyone to, to focus on is the new goal count for Gordy Howe. 1143 because what we're going to do is we are now going to um, we're going to uh, scale out our storage manager environment okay just as we did our, our TEs but now we're going to scale out our storage managers remember right now we have one copy of the database right we have one storage manager let's create our second storage manager effectively creating a second copy of the storage and we're doing that right now. We're going to go back um, to our new ODB command line. And oh, it looks like window. Oh, this window's frozen too. It'll come back. Let's see if this one's still running. Yep. There we go. Looks like I lost my uh, connection, but that's okay. We're just going to connect right back in. It's a live demo. That's what you get. That's right. But it's fun to watch everything work live. Okay, I've reconnected to that application pod. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and run that same command we ran before where we, we see our, um, our new ODB system. Okay. Now, if you remember, what we did is we scaled up our storage managers, right? We added one, and here it is, right? We, here, here is our old one on uh, IP 103. We have, now have a new storage manager. So our system is now redundant, right? We have um, we can take a failure on any process and know that we're still, um, you know, processing applications and still storing the data. And now we have two copies. Um, so what it's done is it's made a copy uh, of the database in the second one. We're going to go ahead and kill the first one. The first one is the one that originally had the update. Remember when we updated, uh, um, you know, Gordy House. Um, all-time scoring records. So I'm going to just, again, I'm just going to be mean to the system, and I am going to delete that storage manager right out from underneath OpenShift. Please. Okay. Ouch. Just deleted it. All right. So, but we know since OpenShift is enforcing my environment, uh, that it's already busy replacing that storage manager with a effectively a second new one, right? Because we scaled out to two. That was our second new one. And, and now um, it's replacing the first, with which effectively is a third. So if I show the system, we'll see it's already added it, okay? And it's in the process of removing the first one. Here's the first one. It's still showing uh, as part of the system. Uh, even though we know it's gone, it just takes a, a moment to update. We're doing all this live, but we can see now that we already have our system enforced again. We've got two storage managers and two transaction engines, which is exactly what we asked for in OpenShift. So if we go back to our environment, if we remember that update was made to the first storage manager, we have now two brand new storage managers, but it doesn't matter because uh, you know new ODB is, is, has persistent storage. Uh, so we're going to now run the query, retrieving the data from the new storage managers, and we'll see, in fact, there it is, Gordy Howe still shows his 1,143 records. 
So what we've been able to demonstrate is we've been able to demonstrate a new ODB in an, an open shift environment, um, demonstrating continuous availability. If you recall all the while earlier when we were running our transactions, uh, never did one fail, even though we were removing transaction engines and, and um, storage managers, the applications continue to run. Uh, we were able to demonstrate scale out as well as scale in. And uh, we also demonstrated uh, the load balancing um, portion of the product, uh, where we were, we were using round robin uh, in this demonstration. But it's probably worth also mentioning that uh, we support, um, uh, based on region, uh, load balancing as well. So um, uh, you can prioritize. If I had regions, uh, let's say I had regions in, in, in uh, Boston, New York, and Washington, I can say for my load balancer, um, I want to connect with priority Boston, comma, New York, comma, Washington, comma, star. That would mean I've set a priority. I'm going to connect to a TE first in Boston. If there isn't one, I'm going to connect to one in New York. If there isn't one, I will connect in Washington. And if there isn't one in Washington, well, you know, just give me any one that you have. The whole idea is to prioritize availability so that the, the uh, applications can connect but at the same time offer performance by prioritizing which region you want to connect to. So we've showed a lot today of uh, new ODB uh, in an OpenShift environment. Uh, coming back to our, our OpenShift uh, uh, main console, um, and again, we see we have two storage managers and two TEs just as we've left it at the end of our demo. So that's about what we had prepared as far as uh, you know, a, a show and tell today. And um, we also wanted to, you know, leave some time for, for any questions that we might have. Uh, this has been a, a great, uh, and I think for a lot of us, this, this is all very new. And um, so it, I, there haven't been a lot of questions because I think we're all just digesting this. Um, I wonder if you can go back to your final slide. You said you had some resources. And if there's a place where there's some um, documentation on what you've done with OpenShift? Was there a blog or a documentation page? Um, people get more information? No, I don't, I don't believe in this presentation we do have a documentation page. I guess I neglected to put that in. Um, but what I can do, um, Diane, is maybe I can email you some links to, you know, where you can find our Red Hat certified container, where we, you can find a blog that tells you how to deploy and it would be an OpenShift. And maybe with your with the blog, we can include that information. And that I can also do things like I don't know if you make the slides available separately from the video, but I can also update the presentation with that information as well. Add it into the slides. That would be great. Um, I do. Okay. Uh, we'll, we'll add that up and we'll upload this the, the, this deck and that um, there as well. Um, you asked a, a question, or you you sort of asked for suggestions around um, persistent storage, and um, I know. Um, there's lots of choices when you're doing persistent volumes um, with OpenShift, so um, there's some good documentation around that um, for if, um, on our uh, docs.openshift.com around types of persistent volumes that you can set up. I think that's the answer to your your question, your you guys' question about suggestions for storage. Is we pretty much let people choose what they want to use. Um, whether it's EBS and AWS or Ceph or Gluster or NFS or if they're OpenStack, Cinder folks or whatever they'd like to use. So um, Exactly, yeah. yeah I think Great. Yeah, I saw Great, that thank link. You. Thank you very much. It's very helpful. Um, so, you know, one thing that I would like to hear from, you know, as people kind of digest the recording and come back and look at the slides and read the blog and whatnot, is, you know, I'd love to hear from the OpenShift community, you know, what they'd like to see, you know, next in the demo. This demo is an evolving demo. Um, we keep adding additional features and functionality and to showcase various different, you know, kind of benefits you can derive from NuoDB and OpenShift. But, you know, if there's things that people think specifically they'd like to see with a database and OpenShift, and, you know, I, I'd love to hear about that. So The other thing is if this demo itself, um, I'm sorry, it's a database demo, whether it's the the code for it is in GitHub um, that they could run the demo themselves. But it sounds like there's a little bit of setup and database thing. So if if this is something that you can.
foot so that they if somebody wanted to play and try and doing the demo themselves and teach them yeah that's, that's a really great idea um we're working on something that uh, where people can actually play with it and where they can be guided step by step through a demo this particular demo um, would be difficult to put up on GitHub to show because it uses, you know, the full enterprise version of our product. We have a free community edition that we highly encourage people to download and play around with. So we'd have to we'd adapt the demo um, to that. It should be very simple to do, though. So um, stay tuned is what I would have to say to that one. Yeah, no, it's wonderful. And this has been very helpful for me to understand what you guys are offering, and I'm sure to the community, and I'm sure to all the um, solution architects inside of uh, Red Hat as well who have been um, looking for a solution like this to, to offer um, so and lots of our partners are are interested in in this uh, it's quite hilarious for me to see all the old timer hockey people and um, in some ways looking at SQL again feels like oh my god we're going back in time but it's a it's a great thing to see because there is so much people so many people out there still very um, actively using SQL and and making it um, part of their enterprise offering. So this is a really helpful thing as they navigate to the cloud. So thanks for your time today. Um, and I will get this up probably in the next day or so, um, depending on how fast the video editing goes. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity to reach the, the community. Right. And I will we'll be